Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to COVID-19 in Context. I'm Keith Mellinger, the Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Mary Washington. I'm happy to welcome everybody back to week three of our course. Uh, we've got some good stuff coming to you this week. I'm really excited about the presentation today. Um, today we're going to hear about how the pandemic uh, interfaces with climate change and joining us today is one of our faculty in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences, uh, Professor Pam Groth. She's an assistant professor in that department and she's an expert on climate science. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what she has to share with us. She has a few other guests joining her uh, after her talk for the Q&A. So send those questions in and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we get to those uh, later on in the hour here. But for now, let me turn it over to Dr. Pam Groth. Great, right. thank you, Dr. Mellinger, and welcome everyone. Um, we really have an exciting class lined up for you today. So as Dr. Mellinger mentioned, I am an assistant professor in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department, and I am a climate scientist, or actually a paleoclimate scientist as I study past climate change. Um, so the plan for today's class is that I'm gonna give you a broad overview for about 25 minutes on our climate system and then the impacts that we have seen on the climate with economies shut down around the world during the pandemic. And then I will have each of our panelists, so Dr. Eric Bonds, Dr. Charlie Sharpless, and um, Dr. Jeremy Hoffman here briefly introduce themselves, providing a little background information on their expertise related to the subject before jumping into the Q&A for the last 30 minutes. And I just want to begin with all that's happening in the world and in our country. Now is really the time for us to come together and keep talking about climate change, especially because this is another social justice issue that illustrates the disparities in our communities uh, with so many more African Americans affected by the impacts of climate change. And if you've been paying attention to the news, you've probably been hearing about the stories about how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting our environment and climate. We've heard about the clearer skies, the cleaner water, the quieter cities, and the reduced emissions all around the world during this pandemic. But before I start, I just, I have to preface that not a single environmentalist or climate scientist would wish for such an event as a way to clean our air and to reduce our carbon emissions. So the reduced emissions that I'm gonna talk about, they are not from decarbonizing our economy. They are from the forced lockdowns around the world at the consequence of human lives lost and the economies paralyzed. So we should not celebrate this. But what I think is that we can really learn from this information to help drive policies um, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, to reduce our air pollution, um, especially as we develop these recovery stimulus packages for rebuilding our economy. Now climate change and its impacts, they've been making headline news over and over, especially prior, towards, prior to the pandemic. And it's usually never good news. So here are just a few examples from earlier this year from the New York Times and the BBC News. Um, Australian bushfires that ravaged 72,000 square miles and destroyed almost 3,000 homes and 6,000 buildings, killing 34 people directly and, and many more indirectly from poor air quality. And it even displaced billions of animals. Um, scientists say that bushfire risk is 30 times higher with the extreme prolonged heat that this region is experiencing because of climate change. The UK saw some of its worst floods this winter with record rainfall. The month of February was actually the wettest on record since they began recording rainfall in 1862. And news articles on melting ice sheets, they're constantly coming out, um, especially as we get better technology to measure those changes. And of course, it seems that every year we are topping the records with 2019 being the second warmest year on record. Now without our atmosphere, Earth's temperature would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit. But instead, our global temperature is a balmy 59 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is because of the greenhouse gas is the most abundant um, greenhouse gas. Um, but of course, there's carbon dioxide or CO2, um, which we are mostly um, concerned about, and methane as well. Um, so the sun provides the energy and shortwave radiation. And that's mostly invisible to our atmosphere. And about 30% of that energy is reflected back into space by things like clouds and ice. 
Um, but then the Earth absorbs the rest of that energy, then it re emits it back out as long wave radiation. And then those greenhouse gases, they absorb that long wave radiation and then they emit it back out in all different directions, creating that greenhouse effect. The more greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, like carbon dioxide, the harder, hotter our planet will be. We can very easily measure the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Um, so the, the longest and most famous CO2 time series is from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, and it's called the Keeling Curve. Um, so this is a plot of CO2 concentration in parts per million at Mauna Loa. It goes back to 1958. And there are two trends that you can observe. So first is that oscillating pattern seen in that red line, that, that up and down pattern. And that represents the seasonal cycle. This is driven mostly by the Northern Hemisphere where there's more land. Um, so in the spring, as plants bloom, they take up the carbon dioxide, lowering the atmospheric values. And in the winter, as plant matter decays, the CO2 is released back into the atmosphere, raising the values. And then second is that long-term trend of ever increasing values from below 320 parts per million in 1958 to over 415 parts per million today. This trend is from burning fossil fuels. On average, the concentration rises over two parts per million a year because of the fossil fuels we emit. And I actually just checked for May 2020 and we're at 417 parts per million. So this is really an incredible record as it was the first of its kind that, that highlights the rising concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So as a paleoclimate scientist, I always like to put the present day in perspective of the past. Scientists are really clever, and we have developed many different measurements to quantify past atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Now, the most forward method uses air bubbles trapped in ice, as they are like little time capsules of, of ancient air. Um, so what I'm showing you here is an ice record that goes, uh, ice record of CO2 concentration that goes back 800,000 years ago. So I've marked in yellow lines our present day concentration at 416 parts per million. Um, and then what we refer to our pre-industrial um, concentration. Um, so before we started burning fossil fuels, which was 280 parts per million. And so what you're looking at here is the rise and fall of CO2 concentration about every 100,000 years as our earth goes in and out of ice ages. Now I, I could go on and on about this record and what causes this, but for the sake of time, um, what I wanna point out to you is that there is no time in the last 800,000 years where CO2 concentrations were as high as today. The pre-industrial value is consistent with previous warm periods, but we have to go back 23 million years ago to see these kinds of levels above 400 parts per million. But we also have to keep in mind that at that time, the rise to those levels were gradual. They were not sharp like today. And in fact, carbon is almost solely the source for our warming today because of that greenhouse um, effect that I already mentioned. When we try to model our historical and our present day temperatures, we can't get the right answer unless we add that human factor. So this plot here illustrates the, the temperature changes over the last 100 years where the green shading just models those natural climate factors like sunspots and volcanoes. And you can see that we don't get that temperature spike until we add the human factors from burning fossil fuels, which can be seen in the blue shading and matches that black line, which are our observations. So natural climate variability does cause some ups and downs in temperature, but that's it. They are just background noise amongst this long-term trend of rising temperatures. And it seems that almost every year we are breaking the charts, charts in terms of global record temperatures. 2019 was the second year, um, second warmest year on record. The last five years are all the hottest years on record. And if we look at the 10 hottest years on record, they're all since 2005. Virginia is not immune to warming either. This is a plot of temperature data for Richmond from NOAA's Climate at a Glance portal. And actually, in fact, the, the stripes that you see outlining the left of all of my slides are the warming stripes for Virginia. Overall, Richmond specifically is warmed by almost half a degree Fahrenheit by each decade, which is seen as that blue trend line here. So we're getting hotter. We're getting muggier as dew point temperatures rise. Heat waves are increasing. There are six more days above 95 today than there were back in 1970. And there are more than 160,000 people in Virginia are vulnerable to extreme heat, especially those under the age of five and over 65 and those living in poverty. Um, and actually, my, my student, Allison Grant, and I, alongside with Dr. Hoffman, are exploring how lower-income communities in Virginia are disproportionately exposed to extreme urban heat. 
And Dr. Hoffman will be able to speak more about this from his research during the Q&A. But the impacts are far reaching than just warmer temperatures. Uh, much like most of the US Northeast, we'll see rainier days, but more as periods of intense rainfall over short periods of time, um, increasing flooding risk. With higher sea levels or with sea levels rising, um, high tides will cause more coastal flooding or what we call sunny day flooding. Tropical storms are ex also expected to get stronger as they are fueled by warmer water, causing even more flooding with storm surge on top of higher sea level. But maybe most importantly is the impact that climate change will have and is already having on our health. Um, with more extreme heat days, heat related illnesses will be up. Warmer air leads to more smog, which triggers asthma. Allergy season will be longer and more intense. More coastal flooding will make it harder for emergency services to reach people. Saltwater intrusion and increased runoff from heavier rains, they'll pollute our water, making some of our drinking water and seafood unsafe to eat and drink. And there will be an increase in mosquito and tick-borne illnesses. So you can see why we call this a crisis. I just listed a few of the impacts and mostly as they pertain to Virginia, but the impacts are dire. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has very carefully outlined the consequences from just a one and a half degree Celsius warming in temperature to a two degree Celsius warming in temperature from pre-industrial times. And so these reports, they're written by dozens of climate scientists. They're very carefully peer reviewed by hundreds more. So what is plotted here includes our monthly temperature change in the gray line. And then the estimated warming, the estimated warming in the red line. And then this projects on different scenarios to keep our total warming from pre-industrial times to about one and a half degrees Celsius. I should note that we have already warmed by more than one degree Celsius, which is almost two degrees Fahrenheit. And that our most ambitious goal is to stay within one and a half degrees C's warming. And I find the one and a half degree C warming report extremely, alar extremely alarming knowing how hard it is going to be to meet that goal and knowing how drastic the consequences will be even from just a half a degree Celsius warming difference from more intense flooding and droughts to more species going extinct, corals especially at my heart, um, to worse climate related health impacts. And not to be too depressing, but right now if no measures are taken, we are on track for a three to five degrees Celsius warming by 2100. That's an increase by 5.4 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. But let's look at the main problem, uh, what the main problem is and where all the carbon emissions are coming from because we need to know how and where to cut back if we want to ultimately reach those warming targets. So if we break down our emissions globally, we can get a sense of where most of our emissions come from. Over 75% of our emissions are directly related to burning fossil fuels. The other 24% coming from agriculture and land use changes. A quarter comes directly from electricity and heat production, so that direct burning of coal, natural gas, and oil for electricity and heat. And then the rest is comprised of industry, transportation, um, buildings, and then other just being energy not directly associated with electricity or heat production. Um, but maybe a bit more relatable, let's just look at US emissions. Um, half of our country's emissions comes from the transportation and power or electricity. Um, then industry comprises of 22%, where agriculture, commercial, residential, they combined make up the last 20%. And actually, um, almost 50% of Virginia's emissions is transportation alone, um, with power making up almost a third of our emissions after transportation. So this brings me to the pandemic, where life was disrupted for everyone. Global economy shut down as people mostly stayed in confinement. General operations were reduced from businesses and institutions and governments. And many businesses, they, they either shut down or provided employees the option to telework. And governments mandated stay-at-home orders that were largely followed. So I found this picture that someone took of Atlanta of no cars on the main interstate. And I was particularly fascinated with this after living in Atlanta and knowing how bad the traffic is there. But this is actually something we saw all over the country. So plotted here is nationwide uh, traffic data from NRIX that shows the decline in traffic volumes to over 40% in late March and April. Um, but of course, you can start to see the gradual rise through May as things started to open back up. And the same trends have been reported all over the world in major economic countries. The International Energy Agency reports that global average road, road transport activity fell by 50% of 2019 levels by the end of March. 
Um, but besides the carbon emissions from cars, there are other things that we care about that affect our health, such as carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, hydrocarbons, and particulate matter. And I just want to briefly focus on the particulate matter in the nitrogen oxides. So particulate matter are extremely fine material, less than 2.5 microns. So to put that in perspective, the human hair is 50 to 70 microns. And it is well known that this affects human health, increasing risk of stroke and heart disease and cancers. And in fact, almost 7 million people die each year because of air pollution. And what is more striking is that we found that areas with higher exposure to particulate matter have a higher mortality rate from COVID-19. Um, even here in the United States, counties with higher pollution will have a COVID-19 death rate 4.5 times higher than those with low pollution. And it's not even across the board affecting lower income and African American communities the worst. Um, but the good news is that air pollution can be reversed more quickly as we've seen. Um, so first we saw the dramatic images of some of the most polluted cities from before and then during the pandemic that showed significantly um, clear air. So here's just one example from New Delhi, the world's most polluted city. And then we saw the, the satellite measurements of nitrogen dioxide, so one of those other tailpipe pollutants that quickly emerged, um, starting with China. Um, a recent study published that they estimated 35% reduction in particulate matter and a 60% reduction in nitrogen dioxide following the lockdown. I mean, you can see that clearly in this image where the cloud of those orange and reds or the high NO2 values around Beijing virtually disappears. I mean, major cities in Europe, they saw, the, they saw very similar reductions in air pollution as well, coinciding with their strict quarantine measures. And NASA even published NO2 values for the US Northeast, um, showing an average of a 30% drop. Um, and you can see this, uh, the largest changes were around our major metropolitan cities, such as New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Washington, DC. Um, but of course, things are constantly evolving. And as restrictions ease, air pollution is returning just as fast as it improved during the confinement period. And so this was an article just out last week in The Guardian saying that air pollution in China is back to pre-COVID levels and Europe is closely following. And if we look just here in Virginia, we too have been driving less. Um, so I have to give a plug to my other student, Eden Rakes, who is trying to quantify the total amount of reduced emissions from the state of Virginia due to the mandated stay at home order. So she compiled this data from the Virginia Department of Transportation and the state as a whole, seen as the black line, has seen about a 40% reduction in traffic. Um, but of course, as the state begins reopening, those traffic volumes are already starting to creep back up. And um, Dr. Hoffman has also looked into air quality improvements in Richmond that he could speak more to as well. So how does this all relate to CO2 emissions and global climate change? So if you recall that our goal is to keep global average temperatures to within that one and a half degrees Celsius warming to lessen the environmental, the ecological, the human health and the economic impacts. To do so, we need to reduce our emissions by about seven and a half percent every year. So let that sink in for a minute. Seven and a half percent every year for at least the next decade or until we reach net zero emissions. There is precedent from previous major economic disruptions causing small dips in carbon emissions. Um, so this plots the rise of CO2 emissions in billions of tons of carbon, which is gigatons. And you can see small dips here from the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, the War of Wars, the Soviet Union collapse, and the most recent one being the 2008 and 2009 financial crash, causing about a 1.3% dip in carbon emissions. We expect that the drop this year will be the greatest drop since the Great Depression. The bad news is that once the crisis is over, is emissions soar back up and they're usually higher than what they were before. Um, but this is something that we need to stop from happening this time. Um, but of course, doing it in a responsible manner, prioritizing clean energy and, and spurring economic growth and jobs. You can see our forecast here for 2020 is plotted as that red dot. Uh, many groups have already tried to predict where we'll end up at the end of this year and estimates range anywhere from four to ten percent reduction and those estimates are constantly changing but either way we do expect this to represent the largest annual drop in emissions ever recorded and this is a hot topic so in a paper just out in nature which is a premier peer-reviewed journal from the most cutting-edge science 
a group estimated the total reduction of global emissions during the pandemic. And this isn't easy to do because we do not have real time CO2 emission data. So they deduce their values based on overall energy data available from the top countries that are responsible for 97% of global emissions. And they found an average 17% daily reduction in CO2 emissions compared to 2019 levels. So when plotted here with the yearly rise, this looks quite like a steep drop in emissions. We can zoom into it month by month and you can see the trend a little bit better. Now it's not consistent or constant because countries went into lockdown at different times. Um, in fact, if you just look country by country at the peak of each of their lockdown, emission reductions were on the order of 26%. Um, but at the time of the largest reduction emissions in early April, we hit 2006 levels. Now they even break this down by energy sector. And overall, there is a 7.4% reduction in the power sector, which that's electricity and heat, a 19% reduction in industry, that's the production materials, mostly based on coal consumption and steel production, 36% um, reduction in surface transport, which includes everything on the roads, including national and international shipping, 21% um, reduction in public buildings, and a 60% reduction in aviation, with a 2.8% increase in residential, which is not surprising with so many people staying home. But, what we really have to consider is the total percent that each of these represent in total emissions. So for example, aviation or flights, both domestic and um, international, they represent the largest decrease wise, percentage wise at 60%. But since they only account for less than 3% of our global fossil, fossil fuel emissions, it did not have a significant effect on overall emission reductions. However, surface transport, meaning cars and trucks and everything driving on the road, that accounts for 20% of global fossil fuel emissions, and it saw a 36% decrease, thus actually having a real impact on total overall emission reductions. And so this group, they estimate a 4 to 8% decrease in annual emissions. They note that it is hard to estimate as it depends on the duration of confinement. Um, of course, the emission reductions in this manner are not welcome, um, but what it does provide is a learning opportunity to discuss the types of measures that could deliver the most significant long-term impact on emission reductions. And with fossil fuels still being burned, atmospheric CO2, CO2 concentrations will still rise. We are still emitting CO2 and it will continue to accumulate in the atmosphere. You can think of CO2 in the atmosphere as a bathtub of water, where the emissions are the faucet and the water, uh, emissions are the faucet of the water coming into the tub. The lockdowns just mean that the tap has been turned down ever so slightly, but CO2 is still streaming into the bathtub. And unfortunately, just looking at the first three months of this year, which is seen as the black line in this plot, 2020 is already tracking to be one of the warmest, if not the warmest year on record. Uh, meaning that even such sudden cuts in carbon emissions related to the coronavirus pandemic will not affect global average surface temperatures in the near term. Um, so again, um, cutting emissions by cutting economic activity is not the solution, and we should not be cheering for this. The suffering resulting from this pandemic, both in health and economic terms, is something that we have to avoid as we move forward and not only avoid, but be, help be part of the solution towards better health and more prosperous economies. Um, but we can take this as a lesson that if we really implement systematic change from top down, we can make a difference. And I think the most promising are the reductions in emissions from surface transportation for traffic, both, both globally and locally here in Virginia. We saw that this energy sector is responsive to policy change and economic shifts. Um, cities even closed down their streets to traffic, making them pedestrian friendly. Um, but secondly, we really need to see a wholesale shift to decarbonize our power sector. I think that this will be important, especially as we rebuild our economy, as this has the potential to create jobs and save money over the long term on energy costs. Um, this is something that maybe Dr. Sharpless um, could speak to more during the Q&A. Uh, and lastly, I think that this also highlights that we can't make this happen from individual action. Um, even if we as individuals did everything we could to cut our carbon footprint, it would not be enough.
but I don't want to belittle that effort because every little bit helps. And I do think that there is a lot of power for individual action for initiating those grassroots movements to get those more systematic changes to happen from top down. And if the pandemic has taught anyone anything about climate change, it's the understanding of how to flatten a curve. Um, so very similarly here, we can illustrate the importance and the urgency to implement the climate protective measures, reducing our carbon emissions and to keep those global temperatures below one and a half to two degrees C warming to avoid the most catastrophic consequences of climate change. So I read an analogy that I really like that compared the two crises, that the COVID-19 therapies, the so ways to make people more comfortable while recovering from the disease are like our climate adaptations, are making our communities more resilient. Whereas the vaccine that scientists are feverishly trying to develop for COVID-19 is like net zero technologies and practices. And I really like this quote from Bill McKibben, co-founder of 350.org. He said in a 60 minutes interview, if we flatten the carbon curve, then people might look back in 50 years at this time and thank us instead of curse us. So to conclude, um, we saw dramatic improvement in air quality in a matter of weeks, illustrating how quickly we can turn around that situation by reducing fossil fuel emissions. Scientists found that day-to-day -day global emissions were down on average of 17% compared to 2019. And they suggest that the annual emission reductions will be anywhere between four and 8%. Now that higher end is on par with what we need to reduce our emissions every year for the next decade at least to meet the IPC one and a half warming target. But of course, this is not the solution on how to do that. We really need the systematic change driven by better policies to limit our warming and reduce the impacts related to climate change. I mean, I, I realize that this is going to be hard as many local and state governments are struggling financially, being hit hard by the pandemic, um, especially as they would face high upfront costs to decarbonize the energy sector. And, and maybe even more so with our current national leader relaxing environmental standards, and so I think it's gonna be really important to be creative in, in how we make this happen. And um, Dr. Bonds will be able to speak more on the role of government as we recover from the pandemic. Uh, so with that, I would like to introduce our panelists. Um, so we have Dr. Eric Bonds, he's an associate professor of sociology at UMW. And then we have Dr. Charlie Sharpless, uh, assistant director for research at Princeton University's Anlinger Center for Energy and Environment, and also former UMW professor of chemistry. And then Dr. Jeremy Hoffman, um, chief scientist at the Science Museum of Virginia. Um, so right now, if each of you wants to turn your videos on and join us and give a few um, brief remarks before we move into the Q&A. And um, I'll go ahead and start with you, Dr. Bonds. Sorry. Okay. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, I'd just like to, to briefly add, you know, that there is that uncertainty about how will, how will we respond um, to both the coronavirus economic, you know, fallout and to the climate crisis. You know, that's really where the uncertainty is. There's no uncertainty about the climate science itself that Dr. Grouth um, presented so well. It's the uncertainty about what will we do, especially you know, given these um, really new circumstances uh, that we all live in, uh, given the pandemic. Um, so first off, the, the you know the Trump administration really, um, since when Trump first took office, has systematically worked to uh, roll back environmental standards, and including um, Obama era climate. Um, mitigation or you know emissions reduction policies and so when that happened states and cities um, kind of tried to step up and in so do or in doing so really became the the most effective level of climate policy in the United States but states and cities are also the levels of our government that are being most heavily impacted by the coronavirus economic fallout as um, as tax revenue declines. And so that means that there's gonna be a lot of pressure on these localities and states to put climate change in, in the back seat in order to deal with the economic context. And you know, we can see this happening all over the nation, including here in Fredericksburg, in fact, where Dr. Both and Dr. Sharpless and myself have all been part of an effort to encourage the city of Fredericksburg to commit to 100% renewable energy and to make that shift sooner rather than later. 
and we're building a lot of momentum and we're hoping to push for the city to hire a sustainability manager but then the uh the coronavirus pandemic happened and tax revenue uh, dramatically fell for the city and the city had to furlough 40 employees and all of a sudden you know that hiring a sustainability director was just no longer uh you know in, in the realm of possibility right now and so we see this same thing happening here but all around the around the nation um, the coronavirus pandemic and this economic fallout also can you know, present a, a justification for those who would like to weaken environmental standards to do so further to say that this would this would aid and assist industry but on you know the other hand most economists agree that the, you know to pull us out of the economic collapse that we're in that there will be a continued need for federal spending big federal spending in order to promote job growth and to stimulate the economy and so if this can be combined with efforts to uh, you know build wind turbines all over and solar panels all over and to increase energy efficiency and batteries and smart grids and things like that um, that this can help us deal as Dr. Groth was saying with two crises at once with the climate crisis and the uh, and the coronavirus um, crisis um, so a lot of times that you know this has been discussed as a green new deal and it you know really hasn't had any successful traction in terms of effective policy making so far but in the next few years it might become much more of a possibility so that's all i have right now great thank you um so now uh dr sharpless um, I, I want to quickly say what a director assistant director of research does um in a nutshell, my job at Princeton is to keep track of a wide variety of faculty research in engineering and policy to address climate change and sustainability. And internally, I manage a few different funding streams to support interdisciplinary projects on that, as well as um, just how to try to help connect faculty so they can solve bigger problems than their individual research agendas uh, address. Um, I have just a few short remarks here that I wrote down, so forgive me if it sounds like I'm reading, because I am. Uh, the question of COVID-19's effects on or relation to climate change has come up in various ways over the past few months. I'd say the initial interest was driven by the large CO2 emissions reductions that we're seeing globally uh, as a result of the quarantines and also public curiosity about whether infectious disease spread and prevalence is related to climatic changes. And since then, a larger discussion has begun over the societal response to COVID and what it can teach us about our preparedness or lack thereof for addressing climate change and its effects. So what I'd like to briefly address are structural challenges we face in dealing with climate change, how COVID has brought these into stark relief, and my unself characteristic optimism about the future. Uh, many of you are likely aware of this. Uh, the graph at the top left is, illustrates the CO2 emissions reductions due to COVID and shows that they are essentially negligible compared to what's required to address global warming. Uh, simply stabilizing uh, uh, global temperatures at 1.5 degrees or so above the baseline average will require net negative CO2 emissions, as Dr. Groth mentioned, uh, by mid to late 21st century. The COVID-related drop is a blip in this context and still leaves us with very large positive emissions that will continue to induce warming. Now, achieving net negative emissions will require major investments in carbon-free energy sources and carbon capture. And there's justifiable concern, as Dr. Bonds mentioned, that the financial impacts of COVID on governments and corporations will stall the necessary investments. At the top right is an analysis by the International Energy Agency of historical and projected growth in global renewable energy generation. Accompanying that is a headline calling out the U.S. for lagging at using COVID stimulus funds to support a green recovery. I juxtaposed the headline on the chart to make the point that focusing too hard on the U.S. commitment to renewable deployment risks ignoring positive efforts elsewhere. As the chart shows, COVID is indeed projected to significantly reduce renewable investments this year because of financial and supply chain disruptions. However, investments should pick up again next year due to a combination of government policies and private sector dynamics. Nonetheless, the growth needed to achieve the target reductions is quite a bit larger than what's currently planned. In this regard, our country has the resources to be a world leader. For example, various analyses suggest that government funding of about $500 billion spread out over the next 10 years would get us on track towards the necessary emissions reductions. The one-time COVID stimulus package in comparison has so far totaled $2 trillion. It's about four times bigger than the estimated renewable investments needed for the whole next decade. So we have ample resources to tackle the problem, and I believe we have an obligation as a developed nation, accounting for roughly 15% of global CO2 emissions, to lead the way. 
So what's holding us back if we have the technology and the money? It all comes down to political will and policy. Our response to COVID has illustrated many things about our society and its capacity to manage a complex and wide ranging emergency. There are lots of interesting, uh, interesting facets here, but what I've picked out to show on the slide at the bottom left is the extent to which faith and reported data on COVID deaths divides along highly partisan lines. A large majority of Democratic voters think the reported cases of death by COVID are too low, while a large plurality of Republican voters believes they're too high. It's another instance reminiscent of the divides over climate science, where the science itself has become politicized and polarizing. In the context of how much work we have ahead of us to address climate change, this is a distressing circumstance, and it might induce despair that we won't be able to muster the necessary political will. However, I would encourage optimism even now when it seems in short supply. The last bit of data on the slide at the bottom right shows a Pew Center poll conducted earlier this year indicating the large majority, 67% of Americans, believe that the federal government is doing too little to address climate change. As shown by the breakdown on the far right, this belief is very strong in Democrats, but it's also reasonably strong in millennial Republicans who will soon be assuming leadership roles in their party and are already having some influence on legislative initiatives such as efforts to institute a carbon tax and dividend. So to conclude, COVID, I'd say, has forced us in an amazingly rapid fashion to confront realities about our society and our planetary impacts in a way we might not have otherwise done in a business as usual 2020. It's revealed structural weaknesses in our emergency response systems and political divides over what's real or trustworthy. But it's also generated opportunities for new thinking about how to assess societal risk from natural disasters, such as those we expect from climate change, and ways in which central and federal governments can better prepare for and mitigate such disasters. We've got a long way to go to recover from the virus, but the lessons we've learned can inform future efforts to mitigate climate change and make society more resilient in the face of its impacts. Great, thank you. And um, last, Dr. Hoffman. Hi, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here to um, bring us from kind of a statewide level of uh, in, in countrywide and worldwide down to um, the city where I live in, in Richmond, Virginia, uh, where I'm the chief scientist at the Science Museum. Um, my job rotates a lot of, around a lot of different spheres, uh, but some of my time I get to do a little bit of interesting climate research, uh, or at least what I think is interesting. And in 2017, um, we, we looked at uh, the temperature across the city of Richmond during a heat wave in July. And um, using sophisticated thermometers, um, on our cars and on bicycles, we basically traversed the city at a several different time periods. At 3 p.m., which is usually the warmest part of the day during the height of the summer, we discovered a 16 degree Fahrenheit difference between the coolest and warmest place at the exact same time. Um, this uh, is almost as large as the, the uh, diurnal cycle itself from sunrise to sunset. Um, underscoring just how different an experience of a heat wave can be for any one person, uh, depending on where you live in the city of Richmond. Now, um, as many of you know, and, and uh, perhaps experience in your day-to-day -day lives, where you live in a city determines a lot about the outcomes related to most of sometimes in your whole life, including uh, how much money you make, how much education you receive, how long you live, and it's no different here in the city of Richmond. And so on the left here, bottom left, I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if I can annotate this really fast. This graph here uh, is heat vulnerability. And what that means is how susceptible based on the, the built environment of their neighborhood plus their underlying health conditions would, would a heat wave be for some particular person. Um, what we then, uh, well, What's really um, alarming about that is that when we look at uh, an aggreg aggregated COVID risk, basically looking at what are some of the observations of who suffers either very high risk of getting COVID-19, but then also what are the ones, what are some of the underlying uh, health conditions that actually exacerbate the illness, um, that's up here uh, on the top right. And your eyes aren't playing uh, a trick on you, they look very similar. Um, then ultimately down in the bottom right is our RVA Green 2050 plan or our um, equity centered climate action plan for the city of Richmond. This is the aggregate climate vulnerability, including things not only like heat, but things like flooding risk and uh, infrastructural um, age. You, what you see among all three of these maps is that 
it's virtually the identical populations of people that are at a higher risk of suffering um, from a heat related illness, uh, COVID-19, whether to get it or to, or to um, succumb to some of the, the symptoms. And then overall that kind of long-term march towards a warmer, wetter future, um, they're at a higher risk of experiencing those impacts. Um, and I hope that this just underscores the fact that we see these disparities playing out um, at, at the global and national and state level, but really it's in our own backyards that we can see these sorts of vulnerabilities playing out. And I hope that we start to connect the things that we, um, that we suggest that we do in the face of these challenges to have an eye towards this mo move towards equity because ultimately these same areas in the city of Richmond, among many others in the state of Virginia and around the country, are those that were systematically denied financial resources by the practice of what is known as redlining in the 1930s and 40s, um, which basically selected uh, communities of color and ethnic communities in our cities to not be granted um, uh, mortgages, homeowners insurance, and uh, an overall um, uh, investment in things like even something like grocery stores. So by having a lens towards achieving equitable outcomes, we actually will all enjoy um, uh, the benefits of addressing these things systematically as such. So that's what I wanted to add to the conversation. I look forward to the question and answer session. Pam, thanks so much for, for inviting me. Thank you guys. Well, Dr. Growth uh, and all the panelists, thank you so much for the terrific presentation. Incredibly thought-provoking, and there's so much rich data there to, to explore, and a lot of really great questions, the Q&A. So I want to get right into it, uh, and I'll start with the first question. This is one having to do with wondering about the role of plastics in causing and impacting climate change going forward, and in particular, looking at the role of plastics and maybe even the increased use of plastics uh, with COVID and response to COVID. And so I wanna direct this to Dr. Sharpless first and then anybody else can jump in as well. Um, the question is asking is that with the increased use of masks, disposable gloves, uh, no longer being able to use reusable bags at grocery stores, it seems like we're getting to, to become more and more dependent upon disposable items to be able to get through the pandemic. Uh, what do you think is the long-term effect of this type of behavioral change? Um, I'd say that's a pretty open question. Certainly the use of lots more disposable materials increases uh, currently uh, demand for fossil products to plastics. Um, you know, to the extent that we can shift to plastics to a bio-based uh, initial starting material, uh, I would say there's probably nothing to be concerned about because we're going to, we're trying to design plastics that will not have long lifetimes in, in the environment. Um, and that will be based on carbon neutral sources. Um, the magnitude of the pollution, I really don't have a good sense for, um, you know, the, the COVID related pollution. Um, my guess would be that it's, uh, that the, it's probably analogous to the size of the CO2 dip, uh, which is that it's notable, but it's probably very small in the context of all the waste we generate um, globally and, and nationally. So I, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, in terms of climate change, they're pretty disconnected topics and the, the thread that does connect them is the, the use of uh, fossil oil to, to make plastics. Um, and I don't, it's not that, that's not our largest use of the fossil fuels. Uh, so it's really, uh, in that sense, it's probably negligible impact on climate. Thanks for that. Uh, I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Bonds. Um, there he is. Um, you, you spoke a little bit about the um, the change in habits uh, over over the course of the pandemic, and uh, a question. One of the questions that's asked is, uh, you know, your thoughts on uh, some of the climate friendly habits that were formed under the lockdown. If you think any of those will stick, um, and if so, um, if so, what? Sure, I, I'm honestly that's a great question, and I don't have any you know, um, hard evidence right now, but I've been wondering that exact same thing is you see more and more and more people doing gardening. You know, the, the amount of gardening has notably increased. Um, um, bicycling has increased. And, you know, there are reports all around from you know, bike shops about how many more people are out on their streets. So, 
that might be something in a hopeful way, but yet again, there's a lot of uncertainty here that could actually make you know a larger dis or a larger difference, um, maybe than just the you know the actual emissions reductions that we are experiencing right now. If it's you know part of a larger change in consciousness of people you know thinking more about where does my food come from, um, what are I really like bicycling. I'm glad that I, you know, I tried it again and I'm going to try to bicycle much more. If that can actually change long-term behavior, then, you know, potentially it could have some, some really positive results. Great. Thank you. Uh, I have the next question, I want to turn this to the, the first presenter, Dr. Groth. Um, you spoke to this a little bit, but there's a, a question that a number of people have voted up about whether or not the pandemic has really bought us any time in reversing climate change. Is that something you could elaborate on? Um, it, it really depends. So like I said, if we continue, like we, we suggest that we're going to be about 8% reduced this year, it's on the right direction, but it won't mean anything if we continue to head back up the following year. Um, and actually, I didn't present on this, but if you just look at natural variability, um, natural fluctuations in the carbon cycle, so there's, there's a lot of things that will take up um, carbon from the ocean to the biosphere um, to um, temperature and humidity. The drop in emissions is actually within that natural variability. So really, when you look at just the short term, it's not even going to stick out. Um, it, we would have to continue on that trajectory year after year after year. Otherwise, we're just going to see a little blip that's going to look like a natural drop in, in variability that we see from year to year. Um, for, for example, El Nino years and La Nino years, they're actually the largest influencer on um, the rise of, of carbon dioxide in our, in our atmosphere, of that, that carbon cycle. Um, so it, it, it's only like a slight positive, but in the end, it doesn't matter if we don't continue to do something about our emissions. Thanks for that. One of the, one of the um, attendees in the chat box mentioned the possibility of, of bringing your own grocery bags to the store and, and simply packing the groceries at your car rather than at the checkout line, which I think is a, is a good observation. Um, I wanna turn the next question to Dr. Hoffman, if I could. Um, the question is, if, if carbon emissions were to just stop completely, uh, would the planet return to its original state? How long would it take to, for something like that to happen? That's a, 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 an incredibly uh, rich question that um, is actually being borne out by researchers right now. There was a new paper that was just published this week that reflected on that very question. Now, this is like what Dr. Groth said, where uh, right now you can think of the atmosphere as a bathtub. And right now we're basically for the last 150 years, we have turned the faucet completely on, lefty loosey completely. And that's been filling this tub up. Right now in this very minimal time period, we've just kind of jogged the faucet for a hot second. And so ultimately we're still accumulating CO2 in that tub. Now imagine, if you will, that we just shut it off. If we shut it off completely. That bathtub is still there and it's still full of, uh, of water, which in this case is the CO2 in our atmosphere. So actually we would continue to see some warming that we haven't yet realized, almost like momentum in a really heavy train. You don't just, you don't, you can't just stop a train on a dime. So that would take a little bit of time to catch up, but then ultimately what would then return us back to pre-industrial is that we would have to figure out how to pull all that carbon back out of the atmosphere. So even by shutting it off, we don't return back to pre-industrial. We need to then figure out inventive ways to then remove carbon from the atmosphere in order to achieve that goal. So really what we're doing is we're avoiding by making efforts to reduce the fire hose of CO2 going into the atmosphere, we're safeguarding against more warming than we can sustain as a civilization. 
then what the idea should be is that we then start to remove it as soon as possible. Now, I'd love to invite uh, uh, Dr. Sharpless or Dr. Growth if I've gone too far and I'm, I'm wonkily out of place on that feedback. That's my, my understanding and our understanding as a community is evolving almost uh, day by day in that particular question. I appreciate that very much. Um, did, uh, Dr. Growth, Dr. Sharpless, anything to, to add to that? I can just say that um, if you if we do stop burning fossil fuels now that you know slowly it will start coming out through natural sinks but it's going to take a while so you know thousands of years from now there will still be anthropogenic co2 in our atmosphere yeah i don't that's basically what i was going to say it's, it's a very slow removal process um that's naturally occurring but yeah if we want if, if we want to mitigate the changes we think we're going to see over the next hundred years, uh, as Dr. Hoffman said, we really need to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere to return to normal. You know, I have the next question, and it's actually tied to something that I was part of a presentation about last week, and that is some of the difficulties in communicating the, the biology, the, chem the science of COVID-19 to the public. And then also the parallels uh, as outlined in this question and, and has been pointed out by Dr. Sharpless. And so I'll ask him to, to talk to this first, but the parallels between the difficulties in communicating the reality of anthropogenic climate change, dangers of COVID-19. What lessons do you think climate scientists can learn from this about better communicating scientific concepts to the public? Yeah, it's, that, that's a good question. And it's an open area of research for people working in uh, social sciences and psychology, uh, how to, you know, the scientists are worried and want to be able to communicate better, and we need to know what sorts of tools we can use. Um, I would say something that, that comes out of the realm of climate science and that does not have any parallel that I'm aware of with COVID is uh, how much the, uh, the, the messenger influences the, whether or not the, the message is well received. Um, you know, people who, have, who exemplify good environmental behaviors tend to have tend to command more respect from people on the issue of when they, when they present facts about climate science. Um, I, you know, I think in terms of COVID communication, it's, it's that the partisan divide is so stark that really to me, I think people aren't necessarily operating on facts and, um, you know, that how to overcome that is really not something that scientists are particularly well equipped to deal with where we, we're good at gathering facts and analyzing them, um, but uh, it's going to take it's going to take people with policy communication skills and that understand uh, public how to influence public opinion to to kind of get us on a track where there's more awareness of. I just don't think there's even really that much awareness of what the science really is. People read a headline and they're done. You know that's 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 pretty critical. I think yeah, Dr. Bonds is, is better versed in this than me. Yeah, actually, actually, I was gonna, I was gonna turn to Dr. Bonds on, on this too, and I, I, I do want to hear your take on this. And I, I'd like to throw something else out for you, uh, Dr. Bonds, as well. Is that what is the challenge? Because I know some of the work that you've done locally here, and a lot of it is about educating the public. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak more to that issue, and also, you know, how, how do we uh, educate the public and, and avoid misinformation? Absolutely, um, and. You know, when I see, you know, my colleagues over in the sciences, I mean, they they try to do so much at effectively communicating the science, but in a lot of ways, there's only, you know, a limited amount of things that they can do that it really does point to, well, I'd say probably two things. Um, one, just the importance of science education. Also, the, you know, the importance of the, the kind of messages and cues that are sent out by uh, our leaders and how it's important to you know, hold our leaders accountable and to high standards that um, you know, when, when our leaders you know, say, you know, if they doubt um, climate science, then that sends a message to voters that there's reason to doubt that science. Um, if you know, scientists are telling us we should wear masks to, to limit the spread of coronavirus, but then we see our leaders that are not wearing masks or not doing social distancing, then that you know, creates you know, plausible, I guess, skepticism in the minds of voters and citizens. So there's a really, you know, important role from 
from leaders to educate themselves about science, but I guess a role from us as citizens to, to make sure that our, our leadership is taking the science seriously. So I think you've, you've answered part of this, but this question takes it in a slightly different direction. You know, certainly looking at how polarized our, our politics are and in particular discussions about climate change. Um, this question asks if there's any information or evidence that at some level government is considering laws or rules regarding climate change given some of what they've witnessed with the economic shutdown during the pandemic. Has there been anything coming from local levels or, or state levels, let alone the federal level, that um, given some of the declines and the, the consequences, that they're considering other action? So, so oh, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, well, I just wanted a little clarification on that, um, which is that they're considering action to do what? Is, Action to, to be able to respond to climate change. Okay. To work on emissions, I think is the intent. Gotcha. Eric, does someone else want to speak to that? I mean, I'm not, I'm not aware of anything. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, as the other panelists have said, that it presents us an opportunity. It presents us a real opportunity to rethink um, you know, many things in our society. I mean, I think that when we look out at our country, we see this kind of soul searching in a lot of different ways right now. So it creates opportunities and it creates potentials, but I don't see actu any actual um, policy that's being shaped right now, at least that I'm aware of. Yeah, I mean, I would, so I, in New Jersey, the, the governor has put together a COVID recovery uh, action task force. And one of the things they're tasked with is figuring out how to spur green jobs growth. Um, so while it's not necessarily a federal uh, priority, uh, a number of states are making it a, a state level priority to figure out how to, can they build in tax credits? Can they otherwise incentivize um, you know, economic growth that works towards green jobs? And I say that's the thing that I see people most focused on. Um, a lot of governments are just scrambling to, to deal with the, the impact of the financial crash that has had on their on their operating budgets. So um, long term, I do think, as Dr. Mount said, there's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of soul searching and there's, there will be, you know, the, I think one thing that didn't come up before about um, practices that we've adopted in the face of the virus is the, is the, the, lack, the less transportation, more remote work. I think a lot of places are gonna move uh, more in that direction. Um, so there may be, you know, governments are looking at that and they may be thinking about, uh, what sorts of things can they do to encourage uh, personal behaviors that could lead to lower emissions in their states? Because, uh, you know, a number of states have very aggressive emissions reduction targets, uh, and they're going to need to use every policy they can pull out to, to get them. Well, that, that, um, that's a good segue into our, our last question here, and I'm going to put all four of you on the spot. Uh, what I'd like to know is, for the average citizen, What's one tactic that they can that they can uh, they can use to try to combat this challenge here? So let let's start with uh, Dr. Groth. So I would say I would have to say two, but um, first, it really simple: talk about climate change. Just talk about it with everybody. The more you talk about it, the more people are going to learn about it and hear about it. So just talk about it with your family, with your friends, and then get involved. Um, get involved in those grassroots movements that can initiate those changes from top down. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hoffman? 100% uh, amplify what Pam, Ned, Dr. Gross said. Um, you know, talk about it with everybody and find the thing that tethers climate change to your individual experience. I talk about climate change from the perspective of going fishing with my dad as a kid and how that climate change has shifted the species composition of that particular lake and several others around the state of Wisconsin and how that, um, you know, that conversation starter enables me to have conversations with people across the political divide and really start talking about what are the things that we both agree on? What are the values that we both hold? And then how does climate change then um, come into conflict with those values that we both share and how can we move forward together towards a more equitable future for everyone. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharpless. 
Uh, yes, the, educating yourself and communicating with your, your the community is absolutely critical. I'd say if you're looking for uh, kind of concrete actions to reduce your carbon footprint, um, electrify everything in your house, move away from natural gas stove, move away from natural gas fired heat. Uh, the, the grid itself is moving towards more renewable electricity generation to so the extent to which you could implement uh, heat pumps in your house as opposed to uh, your typical gas fired furnace. Uh, the, the less carbon you will eventually be generating uh, through your use of electricity. All right, thank you. That's a good point. And finally, Dr. Bonds. Um, I would certainly just echo what Dr. Groth said about being involved. Be a, be a citizen. You know, talk to your elected officials. And um, if you don't see an active climate organization in your community, then, then start one. Um, other than that, you can look for things in your own life that have other kinds of co-benefits along with reducing your, your own personal carbon emissions. Um, you know, bicycling is fun and it's a, it's a way that you can cut carbon emissions. You can look at um, going to the farmer's market to getting, uh, you know, get local produce. It's just farmer's markets are fun and it's delicious food, but also reduces um, carbon emissions or eat less meat. That can be healthy, but it's also an important way to reduce um, you know, these carbon emissions causing climate change. Well, good advice. Uh, thank you all very much for that. This was really terrific. Dr. Groth, Dr. Hoffman, Dr. Sharpless, Dr. Bonds, this was wonderful. I, we really appreciate your time. Great Q&A, great presentation, Dr. Groth. Um, thank you all for being here and uh, thanks to all the attendees for being here as well. I wanna just remind everybody that tomorrow uh, we have a special presentation of COVID-19 in context. Uh, the title of our presentation tomorrow is Social Justice Protest in the Time of COVID. We have four terrific panelists who will be joining us tomorrow uh, to talk about those issues. Uh, one reminder um, that was uh, not in the email announcement, but uh, I should, I'm letting you know now and I will send something tonight or tomorrow morning. The link to get into tomorrow's talk is different. It is not part of the regular series, so it is a different link. But I will be sending that out tonight or tomorrow morning. So please check your email for that. The Wednesday talk though is back on our regular schedule and, and the same link will work for all of the Monday and Wednesday talks. So thank you all so much for being here. Looking forward to seeing many of you tomorrow and if not on Wednesday for our presentation on visual arts and plagues, which is also gonna be a really good one. So thanks all for being here. Students, we'll see you soon in the small group discussions. Thank you all so much. Have a great night. Thank you.